our Neanderthal cousins lived for about a quarter of a million years in the harshest environments probably any hominid has ever survived in, the Ice Age Europe. And the fossils are remarkable for several things. First of all, the injuries. The fossils show skull fractures, neck fractures, shoulder fractures, rib fractures, uh, leg fractures, and also they're healed fractures with very little evidence of persistent infection. And the pattern of the fractures in the Neanderthals is most similar to the injury pattern we see in modern, uh, modern day rodeo riders. And so it looks as if Neanderthals had to kill up close. And so they would maybe mount uh, a mammoth and, and try to stab the, the spinal cord. And I love this phrase, ungulates unkindly disposed to the humans involved. <laughs> So they were killing up close, they were getting injured frequently, but many of them would heal and survive, and you see this. And you also see evidence in the fossils of caretaking. And this is up here because this gentleman lived until his 30s, but had had a depressed skull fracture as a child, such that his right arm, the right humerus, uh, didn't grow. His normal left arm is there. So you see evidence of injury, of healing with little persistent infection, and caretaking. Why is this relevant? Because if you think about it, we survived for a long time, long before medicine was invented. And so we had to evolve mechanisms to protect ourselves against injury, but also if we were injured or infected, that we would have mechanisms, self-healing mechanisms. And this is the basis of my argument today, that we have sort of Darwin's HMO in our brain, and that we monitor the environment before we deploy these complex capacities for self-healing and, and self-repair. Um, that's going to be one of the arguments. This, and I'll show you the evidence for the ancient nature of this. And that, secondly, one of the mechanisms for this is social support, particularly the attachment system for deploying these mechanisms. And the other aspect of this is, again, that it's, central, it's under central control. And it uses many of the neurotransmitters that I think will be familiar to you. And again, this mechanism, these mechanisms for self-healing are mediated by the attachment system, the basic caretaking system. Why is this relevant? Because, as you know, religions claim to have an enormous impact on health. At the beginning of the 20th century now, at the 20, beginning of the 21st century, we have thousands of studies that uh, purport to show that there is an impact of religion on survival, cancer survival, recovery from acute illness, thousands of studies. And some of the recent ones have been funded by the Templeton Foundation. And when you look at these studies closely, many of them don't hold up. But some of them may. There is some evidence that religiosity or religious behavior may have impact on mortality. And my argument today is going to be that what we are seeing is religion, in a sense, the best I could come up with this was that they're plagiarizing. Just like they take evolution and claim that it was God. Similarly, they take these mechanisms of self-healing these evolved capacities for self-healing and claim that it is religion. Why is this important to us? Half of medical schools have programs now in religion and spirituality. Places even like Harvard put on CME courses on 
uh, uh, religion and healing, the power of prayer. Legitimate, respected uh, medical schools you know, have these programs, have, have divisions in them for this kind of work. The subtext of this is also going to be that I want to change your view of the word placebo because there's not just one placebo effect. There are many different placebo effects. And placebo effects are in are really these mechanisms for self-healing. And I want to show you the evidence for that, but I think one of the other things I want you to see is how much we don't know. You know how much we still don't understand about this. And I'll also show you how, how we think about placebos. And even the word placebo comes from religion and in a way was poisoned by religion. Before I do that, however, I want to thank a number of people. Uh, Bobby for inviting me, uh, for the organization having me here to speak, um, Andrew Hall for schlepping out to Logan Airport last night to get me. <laughs> also, I would not be here were it not for Richard Dawkins and Robin Elizabeth Cornwell. They're the ones that got me involved in the movement, have supported my work. I absolutely wouldn't be here uh, without them over these past years. I also want to take an opportunity personally to thank Paul for her work. And I'm sure she hears this all the time, but thank you. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, uh, I just loved their story on becoming human. Um, and and it, again, just thank you. Um, and the, the outline of my talk here is, is very simple. We're going to look sort of at the history of placebo, the concept of placebo. Then we're going to look at evolution, basically all of evolution, particularly focusing on human evolution, and as I go through it, to illustrate the bases for self-healing responses, our, our capacities for repair, and, and to bring it up to modern day. The, the idea of a placebo response was known in antiquity. Here's just one comment by Plato. Let's all read it. <laughs> the term placebo comes from a mistranslation. How many mistranslations have gotten us into trouble, religious <laughs> mistranslations? <laughs> this is a true. And it was a mistranslation of the phrase, I will walk uh, with the Lord in the land of the living. And it was mistranslated to, I will please the Lord in the land of the living. Placebo. And the phrase was placebo domino in regione vibor. I will please the Lord in the land of the living. And this was used in Catholic Vespers for the Dead. And the problem was that it became associated with the priests extorting money to say the Vespers. And a singer of placebo came to be thought of as basically a charlatan. And you may not be able to see it, but the, the word placebo is in there. These are placebo singers at funeral. So the term developed from its beginning through religious practices that negative connotation which carries on to this day. <laughs> I think most people think you know, negatively about the term placebo. And one of my goals today is to shift your thinking about that. The placebo, placebo effects are really our involved capacities for self-healing. And the negative notion of placebo it has been throughout medicine. Of course, this is interesting because obviously at the beginning of the 19th century, most medicine was still basically placebo, but they thought they had things that were effective, and there were things that even they thought were placebo and had a negative connotation. Here's something I think 
<coughs> every student should know before they leave high school. A very simple way of understanding evolution. Many of you who have heard me speak before know this drill, but I always do it because I think it is absolutely crucial. It should be part of everybody's knowledge. Imagine that my arms are 4 billion years, 3.5 billion years of life. Here's the beginning of life, here's the present day. So life begins here, replicating molecules somewhat like RNA. All of us on chromosome 1 carry the descendant of that original replicating molecule, probably an RNA transcriptase gene. Then cells get together, simple cells get together, you get eukaryotic cells, and you get LUCA, the last universal common ancestor with all life. A eukaryotic cell, it's thought that we all contain about 100 genes from LUCA. So life is eukaryotic cells. Think bacteria for a couple of billion years and the evolution of the extraordinary machinery of the cell, which we're still mapping out. Then cells get together and they form invertebrate organisms, think flatworms. Why is this relevant? Because with the origin of central nervous systems, you get the origins of crucial neurotransmitters. Serotonin, the oldest monoamine neurotransmitter. Dopamine, norepinephrine. Endorphins, our own internal morphine. Oxytocin. These are some of the crucial neurotransmitters present in all uh, central nervous systems. And these are the things that get boosted in religious ritual. To make a case that part of religious ritual's functions are to boost these particular neurotransmitters. They're also involved in our self-healing capacities. This is cholecystokinin. I put this one out separately because this one actually stops you from deploying your self-healing capacities. Uh, this is probably related to what's known as the nocebo effect. These are people who receive medications or receive placebos and get worse. And it's probably because anxiety is being generated. This paper made it into science because of the following. It showed that a flatworm, a nematode, when it gets infected, its control of that infection is centrally regulated. Don't worry about what the various things mean, but here's uh, your uh, flatworm, and it gets infected, and this innate immune response is triggered. Your innate immunity but, at the level of its brain, you get control of this. So you see from very early on, central control of your innate immunity. And the neurotransmitters that are used are ones familiar to us. Norepinephrine, acetylcholine, uh, GABA, uh, which we use, and uh, in my business, we manipulate with uh, psychotropic medications. So from the very beginning, central control of self-healing responses. A little bit later cousin of ours, some beautiful research in which you take these Siberian hamsters and you infect them and the light is controlled and you make them think that it's winter time, very little light, and they don't completely deploy their self-healing, their, their innate immune response. Then you shift it and you make them think that it's summer and they have a full-blown uh, deployment of their innate immunity. How many of you, when you get a cold in the winter, when you get the flu in the winter, it drags on for a while? How many, when you get it in the summer, if at all, it's over pretty quickly? This may be part of the reason, because you're sensing what's going on in the environment, and a decision is made unconsciously whether or not to deploy your innate healing mechanisms. What we now understand is when you are sick, when I'm sick, when we're sick and feel so badly, it's not the infecting organism. That's our own body. Our innate immune response is very powerful. It is also very dangerous. 
it can kill us. You can you know, jack a fever up to the point where you start having seizures and die. This may be part of the origin of autoimmune illnesses. Because on average, our innate immune system uh, helps us. But it is very expensive, it is very dangerous. So you don't want to deploy it unless the circumstances are correct. And what I'm going to argue is that one of those circumstances in our species is feeling safe. So, let's get back to evolution. So, invertebrate organisms, dinosaurs show up about here. Dinosaurs go extinct about here. You saw the beautiful film clip of, of that. <laughs> what happens? Well, mammals, you know, we were, I think, probably, and, and Paul may need to correct me on this, I think 100, uh, 70, 80 million years ago, and then primates start to show up about 65 million years ago. And what's one of the main shifts? We go from this binocular vision, which allows us to see 360 degrees, but not particularly clearly, and we go from monocular vision to binocular vision, our eyes move to the front of our head, much better vision, but it creates a problem. I need somebody to watch my back. And so this may have been the origin of social primates. So we're now down to about here, the crease on my middle finger. And next time you go to your family physician and he asks for your family history, give him this. <laughs> this is your family history. And so this right here is the crease in my middle finger, right here, 65 million years ago. And this is the primate ape hominid line. The crucial thing here is that we are risen apes, not fallen angels. And this is your family history. So why is this important? Because I need people to watch my back, social living, group living starting maybe to use the attachment system with more than just caretaking of infants, but with, in a sense, colleagues and friends. Then we get to this point right here, this little line right here. This is the common ancestor with uh, chimps and hominids. We get to this little line right here, and if your physician says, no, I want your, your family history, your close family history, whoops, let me back up. This is the original dermatologist. <laughs> and what we see in, in primates is caretaking, right? and, and they're, they're taking care of each other and removing potentially infectious and harmful agents. This, if your physician says, give me your root, you know, close family history, you give them this. This is the hominid line from our common ancestor to us, Australopithecines, Artipithecus, and our most immediate family history, Homo, two million years ago. Homo habilis, Homo heidelbergensis, and again, intense group living, probably without language. And Homo erectus, you know, made it out of Africa to the Caucasus, to Indonesia. We show up probably 160 to 200,000 years ago. There was dramatic climate change. It's thought that we got down to between 600 and 2,000 breeding individuals about 70,000 years ago. And then we expand, we leave Africa, conquer the world. And one of the ideas here is that one of the reasons that we are the last surviving hominid is because we became very conservative about the deployment of our self-healing mechanisms. We don't deploy them easily or lightly. And this is a wonderful paper by Nicholas Humphreys in Current Biology. I highly recommend it, laying out some of the evidence that may be one of the reasons that we survived as a hominid, kind of the last surviving hominid, is because we really were careful before we deployed these powerful self-healing mechanisms, placebo effects. Okay? No longer think negative about it. Here's where I think it gets really wild and interesting. In Siberia, there's a cave, and they found some tiny fossils that they just assumed were uh, Homo sapiens or Neanderthal. It turned out it was a completely separate species. 
and tiny bits of the fossil, they were able to extract its genome. So for the first time, we had a complete genome with very few fossils, the Denisovans. And it appears as if when we left Africa, or some of us, I think as few as 150 people left Africa, we made it with Neanderthals somewhere in the Middle East because all the populations in Europe, China, carry Neanderthal genes. Everybody in this room, about 2.5% Neanderthal genes. So those that stayed in Africa, our African brothers and sisters, a few percentage uh, archaic uh, genes, but for those of us who descend from those who left Africa, about 2.5% Neanderthal genes. And somebody said, uh, my wife could have told told you I was part Neanderthal long before the genetic evidence. <laughs> but then the Denisovans, the, the, in that, in, in somewhere in Siberia, there was a homo sapiens who made it with Neanderthals, also made it with the Denisovans, because those that then continued further south into uh, Papua New Guinea, Australia, have 5% Denisovan genes. Why is this relevant? Because even though it may be a small percent, those genes are connected to your immune system. So you may only have 2.5% uh, Neanderthal genes, but your HLA uh, system, which is involved in, say, tissue rejection and the transplant, over half of a lot of your HL, HLA genes come from Neanderthal. They're important to our immune system. Similarly with those Denisovan genes, that survive. They seem to be very crucial for your innate immune system, which again is your self-healing mechanisms. I put this up here because, and you've seen this before probably, look at the rapid brain evolution in hominids. In evolutionary time, this is very fast. This illustrates it even more, a homo erectus skull, one of ours, and look particularly in the area of the frontal lobes. And remember, Homo erectus left Africa two million years ago. I mean, we started to get out of Africa and made it a, a large, long way around the world, uh, long before Homo sapiens came out of Africa. So we had conquered the physical environment a you know, million and a half years ago. So what would have been the most challenging, complex part of our environment that would have shaped, that would have shaped this rapid brain evolution, particularly frontal lobes? Anybody? Us, absolutely. And you want to think of your brain as a social brain, and particularly your frontal lobes, negotiating the most complex, challenging part of our environment, each other. So, we come out of Africa, and the bottom line is this, and again, this is why I think every high school student ought to know this. Every single one of the seven billion people on the earth today Every single one is the descendant of a small group of hunter-gatherers, between 600 and 2,000 individuals that lived in Africa about 70,000 years ago. Put away your racial, political, ethnic differences. At bottom, we're all Africans, we're all brothers and sisters, we are all the descendants of that small population. All right. Now, when you see a study, and this is also when you see these studies of religion on health. But when you also see reports in the medical literature or in, in some of the alternative medicine literature, whenever you see studies about health effects, something that impacts health, I want you to have this lens in your brain when you look at this material. Not all placebo responders, even in the drug trials, not all placebo responders are actually responding to the placebo effect, number one. Number two, that there are many different placebo effects. We don't know them all. I'll show you some of what we do know. And that the double-blind trials that we've set up for medications might actually inhibit the full placebo effect. We may not even be seeing the full placebo effect in the double-blind trials that we've set up. So, when you see these studies, when you see if the, one of the Templeton studies on religion uh, helping blood pressure or heart disease. Think about the methodology. Uh, does it have sound methodology? That was one of the main problems. 
with their studies. There's a lot of the confounds that they didn't identify. And, and even good scientists, when they did some of these studies, I mean, the original study on, on heart disease and religion was out of Hopkins by serious scientists. This is why you have to keep looking. I mean, they, they missed some crucial things. You can have spontaneous remission. You can have regression to the mean. Particularly uh, measuring signals, there's a lot of ambiguity, and false positives are always greater than false negatives. There's biased reporting. Uh, you know, patients will give biased reports, will, will say they're not having something when they are, and uh, of course physicians, the researchers themselves, I think it's called the Rosenthal effect. You create self-fulfilling prophecies. It's very hard to tease, to, to tease these out, but these are also things that can explain some of these studies. Then you have the genuine placebo effects, and from now on when you hear the word placebo effects, I want you to start thinking, evolved self-healing capacities, evolved self-repair self capacities. And we know some of them. Um, expectation, the reward mechanisms, the dopamine system in your brain, but also the nocebo effect. If one is anxious, one doesn't get better. One doesn't deploy these. Even sometimes when you're given legitimate medicine. Social learning, uh, Pavlovian conditioning, reinforced expectations, uh, white, the white coat phenomenon. Uh, this is a schematic of it. So you hear that you know, you know, twenty percent of people got better in the placebo arm. It may not be a placebo effect. It can be spontaneous remission, regression to the mean, biases, uh, detection ambiguity, unidentified code uh, confounds. Um, that's been one of the big problems with the studies. The things that we don't know, it looks like there's genetic differences in placebo responders, which you would expect. And then the, these are the true, uh, probably some of the true placebo effects where we're, we're triggering actual self-healing mechanisms and some of, the, you know, some of the ways that that is done. What do we know in terms of what placebos will do? What kind of things will they impact? Uh, pain, depression, anxiety, a lot of the things in my business. Parkinson's disease, I'll show you some extraordinary stuff in a moment. Actual Parkinson's disease, actual change of subthalamic nuclei. Immune responses, and, and this, has, this has importance for chemotherapy. We can, we can condition people's immune system. And, and there, there are interesting studies in cancer treatment on this. Serum iron levels. Why, why is that important? What do bacteria live on? Iron. So if you can lower your serum iron levels, you may become real anemic, which is risky to you, but it may be a way of starving out the bacteria. Oxidative DNA damage. Amazing. You know, response to this placebo effect. Mechanism? You know, again, one of, I think, the most interesting unknowns. Insulin. You know, your pancreas is sensitive to placebo. And some of you have seen this, even certain surgeries. How many of you have heard of the, the knee surgery? The placebo thing. Well, and I think what happens is people, you know, oh, just the placebo effect, we tend to dismiss it. And I want to shift your thinking on this. And, and particularly when it comes to the religious stuff, because I think in, in the secular world, when we hear this stuff, we go, ah, placebo effect. You know, I want you to shift your thinking on this. The surgeries are fascinating. One of the, what was thought to be one of the uh, effective ways for treating coronary artery bypass, I mean, for treating coronary artery disease, was a particular uh, uh, operation where they would tie off the uh, mammillary artery. And, and that was a procedure that was done for people with coronary disease. And so they did some sham surgeries where they just opened the chest and closed it up, and the people got better. And, and there was no difference between the, the sham surgery and the actual surgery. So that procedure stopped being done. But coronary artery disease, responding to, you know, quote, placebo surgery. I hope most of you recognize these gentlemen, Muhammad Ali and Michael J. Fox, who have severe Parkinson's disease. An extraordinary study, oh, and, and, and Parkinson's disease is, is damaged uh, dopamine neurons in your brain cells, substantial, very real, awful disease. And 
this was a study, I appreciate it's a busy slide, but I want, I want you to understand it. These are individuals with Parkinson's disease who've got electrodes in single cells in their subthalamic nuclei. And so they're being monitored, both their subjective report, a neurologist is doing a neurologic exam, and the, the subthalamic nuclei are being measured. So this, and then they're given either a placebo or a drug intravenously. This is somebody who was, these are two people who got the placebo. And this is somebody who got a placebo, they have a subjective sense that they're feeling better. Their arm rigidity gets less, verified by the neurologist. Their arm rigidity gets less, and at the level of the subthalamic nuclei, a fall off in, in, in pulse of, of that nuclei. This is somebody who got the placebo and they didn't have a response. You see the rigidity, their Parkinsonian rigidity stays the same. They don't subjectively notice anything and there's no change at subthalamic nuclei. So, you know, a, a basically saline triggering an actual, an actual change at, at, the, at a single neuronal level in, in your brain. Extraordinary. Pain. This is one of the most, uh, most researched of the, uh, where placebo, uh, placebo studies, and what has been shown is, as you would probably suspect, that what gets triggered is our own innate pain system, uh, our endorphins. And uh, also, uh, this is nucleus accumbens, uh, your dopamine, your pleasures, you know, pleasure, the dopamine is also memory, marking salience, a whole lot of things. But uh, rostral anterior cort cortex, and it's hitting particularly opioid receptors. What's the relevance of this? All right. Music stimulates your opioid receptors. Religious rituals stimulate your opioid receptors, and also probably dopamine. And as I'll show you at the, towards the end of the talk, some of these same areas of the brain also light up with the attachment response. And again, a busy slide, don't pay attention to the details, but this is up here, it's a review slide that shows where did you get a lot of the activity. This is a review of multiple studies of placebo effects on pain, and where's uh, some of the great, probably the greatest activity is in the frontal lobes, the social part of our brain where we're probably at some level deciding whether or not to deploy these mechanisms, these self-healing mechanisms. This is a summary slide to show some of what we know about placebo analgesia or placebo pain, pain control. Um, there's some kind of expectancy effect or social learning, or psychological, the, the, the psychological effects get translated you know, at the level of the thalamus and cholecystokinin, remember if probably I don't feel safe, the pain doesn't go away, and endogenous, our endorphins kick in, we you know, feel less pain. It is also related to norepinephrine, serotonin, 5-HT, stress hormones, cortisol. You now these are, this is like a symphony orchestra that's playing and that the placebo response changes how that orchestra plays. Depression. And all of you probably have seen where the studies on treatment of depression have very high placebo rates. People get frustrated and say, well, it's just a placebo. Well, again, there are probably multiple effects, and I'll show you how real they are. Again, a busy slide, but let me explain why I put it up here. These are people who responded to Prozac, fluoxetine, and who also responded to placebo treatment, sugar pill. So these are neuroimaging, and this is neuroimaging of people who responded to Prozac, responded to placebo. These are responders. And in their neuroimaging, the red areas are the, there are multiple areas in the brain of both responders and placebo responders, uh, Prozac responders and placebo responders, multiple areas in the brain that lit up. You had increased activity 
and all those areas that you see are filled in in a red. Multiple areas in both groups. Also, you have areas in the brain that quieted down. The same areas quieted down in both the Prozac responders and the placebo responders. Those are your dark blue. So you can see that there are multiple, over, that there are multiple areas that lit up in both, multiple areas that quieted down in both. It's really indistinguishable. There were a couple of areas, the, the open circles. The open circles are the areas that the Prozac responders, where there was changes with the Prozac responders uh, that you know, didn't happen with the placebo responders, just a few. And in this study, again, the responders, when they were tracked out, the people who received the Prozac stayed better a little bit longer. But the point here is the placebo pill causing actual change in both activity in multiple areas of your brain. Increased activity in certain areas, diminished activity in others. And looking at the imaging, you could predict going back who was going to respond and who wasn't. So this basically shows the people who didn't respond at the time that they get the medication or placebo, they don't respond. The people at the time they get the medication who ultimately responded to the Prozac, you know, their brain was already lit up this way, and this is when they responded to the drug. But there's already activity at the time that they get the drug. Same with the placebo responders. At the very beginning, there's probably some expectancy effect. Who knows? But you can see at the time that they're just starting the placebo drug or the actual Prozac, their brains are already shifted. And you know, these are the people who go on to be demonstrably better. Another one that is interesting, which is along the same lines, these are the people that got Prozac, you see, they, and they responded. These are the people who responded to the placebo. And you can see there's a lot of similarity between the drug responders and the placebo responders. These are people who responded to cognitive behavioral therapy and got better. It's the areas of their brain that lit up were completely different. So these are all people that got better. These people on, Pro, on uh, Prozac, these people on a placebo pill, these people on uh, CBT, and the people who got better, who are indistinguishable clinically when you interview. I mean, everybody's better and has responded, but the people who receive cognitive behavioral therapy completely different areas. Why? Again, one of the unknowns. We know that depression is triggered by stress, and we still carry an ancient mammalian system. Our stress system is a fight-flight reaction. Terror, basically. And that that has something to do with depression and the turning on and off of, of your internal uh, cortisol, your internal stress hormones. And so that may have something to do with what I'll show you. It may have something to do with the sense of safety. The other thing that's interesting is that if you take depressed individuals, their body temperature is a little bit up. It looks like depression is at least got components to it that are inflammatory. That, so depression engages our innate immune system in some way. There are now some studies going on where people are being treated with uh, the anti-inflammatories. You know, Advil for depression, imagine that, or asthma. Yeah, one of the unknowns. We tend to think of the big placebo responders in my business as people with depression, but it also is true with people with schizophrenia, who we tend to think of as having severe mental illnesses with clear, uh, you know, tons of damage to their brain, particularly their cortex, thinning of gray matter. Well, a recent review showed that in, if you look at the studies on schizophrenia, you have comparable placebo responses to the studies on depression. And even more puzzling, you're getting increased placebo responses in recent years and, and decreasing drug responses. Uh, PANS is the, is the scale used to uh, measure the severity. It's a PAN scale as a measure of severity of, of schizophrenia. And, uh, and, and you're getting 
a decreased drug effect in the last two decades, which is not true for antidepressants. And again, this is why, and, and we don't know. The severe mental illness, schizophrenia, increased placebo response to diminished drug response. Oh. We know that placebos, again, can impact your immune system. Your, your particularly the immune system involved in things like cancer, your killer T cells, AIDS, touch. We all talk about you know the laying on of hands, and uh, people have seen the the uh, uh, you know the faith healers are always you know putting their hands on people, um, and the touch is much more important than we've appreciated, and. <clears throat> I want to, uh, my friend Miriam uh, allowed me to uh, demonstrate this a little bit. If you know somebody and you, uh, a friend, and you just, you know, put your hand on their shoulder, you know, friendly pat on the shoulder, there's a tremendous stimulation of endorphins and oxytocin. You think of endorphins as pain, but endorphin is also a trust hormone. Increased endorphins, increased social trust. And everybody knows about oxytocin, the trust hormone. Just, you know, with a friend, patting them on the shoulder, you know, you get that stimulation of those uh, hormones. Even more interesting to me is that uh, Miriam's frontal lobes are sort of idling. They're on a certain idle speed. It's a little bit higher than the rest of her brain. When you, when you do this kind of thing, that idle speed lowers and, and she has a better focus. She can, she can focus better, that idle speed uh, reduces, and she can focus better, just on the matter of touch. Now, this experiment uh, is extraordinary. And if we take Miriam and we put her in an imaging machine, and we show her a threat scenario, her amygdala lights up, the fear center, just explodes. If, however, she's holding the hand of a stranger, let's pretend for a moment I'm a stranger to her, and we show her the threat scenario, her amygdala lights up less. If we show her the threat scenario, and she's holding her husband's hand, her partner's hand, her amygdala lights up almost not at all. And the degree to which her amygdala does not light up is proportional to her rating of the quality of the marriage, the quality of the partnership. The better she feels about the relationship, the more her amygdala doesn't uh, turn on with a threat scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Might get worse. Might get Well, I'll, I'll send an email and warn your husband. <laughs> Here's a tragic piece of evidence for the fact that these placebo effects, these self-healing effects, are centrally mediated. Individuals with Alzheimer's disease do not have any placebo response. You put them in, in trials, all the various trials, they, you know, all the things that we know, you know, work as placebos with people with Alzheimer's disease, not at all. And I think, again, this is indirect and tragic evidence for the central regulation, the sort of Darwinian HMO in your brain that regulates self-healing responses. What's some of the implications of this? What are some of the implications of this? Well, one thing is that the double-blind placebo-controlled trials that we use in medicine, thank God, um, uh, to measure uh, whether treatments are effective, might underestimate the placebo effect. Because if you're in a study and you know you might be getting a placebo, you know you're getting either the active drug or a placebo, you get anxious and you may not deploy your full placebo response. So the double blind trials that we use and are required by the FDA might actually not fully measure the full placebo response. And there's an ingenious study that was done out there on irritable bowel syndrome, where they actually told the people, and, and trying to get around the ethics problems, people with irritable bowel syndrome, they said, 
I'm giving you a placebo. This is a placebo. This is a sugar pill. Um, and because we know that placebos work in irritable bowel syndrome, so they try to get rid of the question of doubt. And sure enough, those people with irritable bowel syndrome who got a placebo, who knew they were getting a placebo up front, got a very robust response. Interesting. What about psychotherapy? In my business, you often hear, ah, psychotherapy. It's just the placebo effect. Well, yeah, maybe. And we ought to learn more about it and use it. And the argument here is that psychotherapy may indeed be a way of mobilizing and making this conservative system that's very careful about deploying itself to deploy itself. Confidential relationship with someone, a secure setting, um, trying to create meaning, meaning in the context of a relationship with somebody. There's a ritual to it. And so psychotherapy, indeed, this pejorative needs to be removed. Psychotherapy may be effective, good psychotherapy may be effective because it is triggering and uh, allowing self-healing mechanisms to be deployed. Let me finish up with a little bit of the suggested evidence about the attachment response being used to generate placebo effects. Um, Mary, uh, some of you may, Mary Ainsworth and John Bowlby. Uh, Mary Ainsworth was a psychologist, and John Bowlby a British psychiatrist, and they're the ones that mapped out the attachment response in human beings. I, I, if anybody's interested in this, look at on um, Being Attached by Robert Karen. It's in the Atlantic Monthly about 15 years ago. Still online, greatest introduction to it. And they matched, mapped out the attachment response in uh, animals, uh, in, our, in some of our cousins, but then, I'm sorry, they took the attachment response that was known in our animal cousins and, and, and mapped it out in human beings. And the idea is that it's based on that, the original sort of uh, parent child, mother child caretaking response and what looks like happened in our species is that we were able to use the attachment system which is originally for caretaking of helpless infants we use the attachment system and brought it into other relationships friends colleagues lovers and what, what one of the things that may go to our uniqueness and so there's a lot of parallel between what we know about the attachment response and what we're starting to learn about placebo effects. Um, the attachment response is evoked by pain and discomfort. What do early caregivers do? You know, anybody who's had a child, you're regulating distress, you're regulating the, the, the pain that an infant is under. Um, the original emotional state for all of us, if we were lucky, was a sense of well-being in our parents' arms. So that early attachment experiences may have a lot to do with the, the basic template for when and how we deploy our self-healing effects. Uh, placebos may serve as transitional objects. Transitional objects are Linus, Linus's blanket. All of us, when we were children, we had things that were sort of part of us, but part of mom, uh, transitional objects. Uh, I had a teddy bear. I think if everybody thinks back, you'll remember your transitional object of childhood that was your connection between you and caretakers. And that uh, uh, maybe placebos uh, evoke our experience with early caretakers and promotes that sense of well-being, and we deploy our self-healing mechanisms. Uh, and so maybe the attachment response and the triggering of self-healing might be deeply related, what might be some of the evidence for that. And you see that in some of the neuroimaging evidence that I showed you. And whether you picked it up or not, but a lot of the things that I showed you that lit up in the neuroimaging of placebo responses are the same things that light up in the brain scans that have to do with the attachment response. So, in summary, we all have 
in our brains a health maintenance organization and that we monitor the environment and it is a very conservative organization that has to make very important decisions unconsciously about whether or not to deploy our innate immune system and all the various mechanisms we have for healing, protecting our lives, recovering from injury, infection, and that um, this is the current, and it's, a, it's just the briefest of outlines, so much we don't know. And that a way to think about this is like the Wizard of Oz. And one of my all-time favorite movies, one of the most favorite movies of all time. And what's one of the themes about, what, what's one of the themes of the Wizard of Oz? It is that all of us are kinder, more courageous, and smarter than we know. All of us. And that's the way to think about this. That all of us have these evolved self-healing capacities that science is just mapping out. And we do not want, and I think need to stand against, religion, again, claiming something that is not theirs, truly not theirs, but that is part of the magnificent legacy of evolution. Thank you very much. She wasn't here when I started my thank yous, but I saw it. And the new, uh, you know, the new uh, relationship between the Dawkins Foundation and the Cyclical Coalition. Thank you. Everybody. Hi, thank you very much for this. You've basically blown my mind, and it's not even moon yet. Um, thank you. That was my goal. Awesome. I had to wait for the placebo in my brain to fix it or something. Um, well, that's why these meetings are important. Like, yeah. Getting together, hugging everybody, and talking about it. It's good for our health. So, when my father told me to walk it off, to shake it off, like when I hurt my leg in softball, like he was basically kind of right on in some ways, and that that maybe I wasn't as hurt as badly as I thought I was, or in general, me being in general, that the placebo effect is something that can be um, maybe taught to my kids. For instance, I have four boys, and if it's if I'm over um, dramatizing their pain or if I'm teaching them that it's a bigger deal than it is, is that something I'm trying to wrap my brain around? What you're? Yeah, I mean, maybe, I'm, but I, I obviously, I'm. <laughs> With all due respect, disagree with your father. If you hurt yourself, I come over and put my arm around you and say, <laughs> yeah. "You'll be all right. Let's, let's, you know, let's, let's walk. Let's, you know, try to walk. Let's see how how much you're hurt." Because what I what I write down, I wrote some questions. Were is 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 there? You obviously show that the brain imaging of people who either knew they were getting a placebo or whatnot. But has there ever been any studies, like genetically, where some people are more predisposed to not respond to something than those who are? Yeah, that's that's some of the great unknown right now. You know, people are starting to look at this, and, and we know we, we know there's variation in responders. But people, you know, people look for personality profiles. There you are know, certain personality profiles associated with placebo response. Can't seem to show that. But they're, they're, if, if you want if you're interested in this, look at the work of a man named Benedetti. You probably saw a lot of my slides came from him. He's an Italian researcher. I think he should get a Nobel Prize in medicine. He's been the most uh, sort of ferocious investigator of this, and uh, they're, they're trying to look at the genetic, you know, it's obviously in the genes. We know, for instance, in depression, uh, all of us carry variations on the gene that uh, regulates the serotonin transporter, which is where Prozac works. And, and we know variations in depression and placebo responses, I think, with, with that gene variation. So it's around the corner. Um, but it, again, it's some of the beauty of um, you know, what's not known. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Uh, I'm, I'm pretty loud as it is. Uh, going on this, uh, the, the actual effect. Uh, a, do you think that there's going to be any uh, pursuit uh, pharmacologically initiating our self-healing capability? And B, do you think that's even a good thing? Well, it, it, in effect, that's what you have. I mean, with, with, with sugar pills, quote, placebo pills, that is a way of pharmacologically, but, but actually targeting, targeting, targeting it with an actual chemical? Yeah, maybe. I, I, I would hope. I, I think the more we understand it, the more that we can use it for our benefit. Absolutely. I think that's the, the, the beauty of, again, the beauty of the unknown of science. I, I, I hope they do. Uh, have there been any studies that show that skepticism impairs the placebo effect, but being skeptical lessens the placebo effect? That would be a great study. <laughs> it, it might it might be out there, but I, I, anybody has anybody seen that? Um, no, I think that would be I, I think that would be. Well, that's a faith healer thing. It's the faith healer says if you're skeptical, then you won't be healed. You know, that's a, that's the yeah. doctrine yeah. that I mean, you get. They, they try, which is connected to your question now, um, Andrew, and I would encourage people to pull it up. There's a wonderful neuropsychologist, a guy named Asp, ASP, and look up his article in Neuropsychology in 2012 called I think fundamentalism, authoritarianism, and, and something else. If you can't find it, email me, I'll get it to you. But it, it, it's a fantastic study. And, and, and he shows that the that we, we believe first, ask questions later. We're really biased towards uh, belief, and that skepticism is, is a hard thing to do. And, and, and he makes the argument that it's a particular area of our medial prefrontal cortex. And it's like a muscle that has to be exercised to strengthen. That it's not as strong as the bias to accept, the bias to believe, the bias to submit to authority. But it, I uh, heartily recommend that article because it goes to the heart of your question is that skepticism is, a, is, a, is not strongly developed, probably for evolutionary reasons. I mean, if you tell me there's a, you know, lions on the other side of the hill, coming after us, it probably would not be a good idea for me to say, Andrew, show me the evidence. <laughs> you know, so for most of our history, skepticism was probably not you know, necessarily always good. But it's a great article. And, and it links it, obviously, with authoritarianism, religious belief. But just on the, the neuroscience of skepticism, unbelievable. Right, this. Pardon me, we need to make this our last question. If okay. we can, we need to make it very quick. Sir, you mentioned that the being conservative in deploying the uh, self-healing mechanisms was somehow an adaptive advantage towards that early breeding population of Homo sapiens. Can you explain that a little bit better in terms of how, relative to the other species, it it was helpful at that time? Uh, again, I, I it's almost counterintuitive. Yeah. Again, the, the best place is Nicholas Humphrey's article. It's in Current Biology, 2012. Pull it up. Lovely article. But he lays out the evidence and makes the argument that maybe one of our traits was that we did not deploy our self-healing mechanisms quickly. We would wait until, and this is my sort of animal, we'd wait until we felt safe before we did it. And that maybe some of our ancestors that died out um, would deploy it too quickly before they um, were, were safe, basically. Because these mechanisms are, are hugely costly and they're potentially deadly. And so the, he makes the argument that our innate uh, immunity, uh, we were very careful about deploying and didn't do it until probably we were taken care of. 
And, and he makes the argument that some of our hominid ancestors may have deployed it too quickly. Uh, now, again, I think it's an interesting argument. I, I don't think I think our Neanderthal cousins. It looks like they didn't deploy it quickly. At least there's evidence of caretaking and self-healing. Thank you very much for having me.